<laughs> uh, thank you. I'd like to uh, call this meeting to order of Common uh, Committee of the Whole, March 14th, 2016. We'll take roll. Bellinger. Here. Fitters. Aye. Oren. Here. Damerel. Here. Donahue. Here. Drawn. Here. Hammond. Here. Heideman. Here. Herman. Jose. Here. Akaf. Here. Lassard. Here. Thiel. Here. Trester. Here. Wolf. Here. 14 present. Excellent. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Thank you. Um, I, I have uh, approval of the minutes from November 9th, 2015. So move to approve. Second. Okay. Um, first, and an approval. Um, chair says uh, uh, approved. <laughs> Under discussion? No discussion. Um, move to continue. All, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? One? Oh. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, 1.5 public forum on agenda items. Do we have any agenda items? Mm. Public forum. Is there anybody here to speak at public forum? Okay. Please state your name and address, and you'll be given five minutes. I get five or three? I thought it was three. Is it three? Oh, I'm sorry, three. All right. Jason Peters, 1225 Kaufman Avenue. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking today, but um, I just wanted, I spoke last Monday. Uh, tonight, you got a big decision as we go forward with uh, Sheboygan. My thoughts, and we'll see after doing this for a couple of years here, if I'm all right. Um, I really think... Deciding on spending $11 million to refurbish a building, is that going to extend the garbage tax the rest of my life? Is that going to extend the wheel tax the rest of my life? It's funny how two years ago we were a city with we were really low in funds, and now we have all this money. Um, I really think what I think is going to happen is the $11 million to refurbish this city hall is not going to happen. I think you're going to rebuild for $7 million and it's going to be like, look what we saved. I think that's the plan in the works. I also think that the architects, who I have a lot of respect for, are going to come up and give a scare tactic where you got to build now or you're going to be paying more later. My question to you, Common Council, is this. We went through last summer with Alderman Thiel, and there was another alder person, Damro, I think. We went through a building you already own, um, and that is uh, the Sheboygan Auditorium and Armory. And the architect there said it would cost $3 million to refurbish. I still cannot understand if you're so bent on spending city taxpayers' money, you wouldn't refurbish that building, use that for city hall, and it's a win-win for the residents that live here that can enjoy it on weekends and weeknights. That's a no-brainer to me. For whatever reason, I think the reason is, is the location of the armory. Uh, if that was downtown here, you would save that building. And it's being a, you know, a little bit hypocritical to say, I want to save iconic buildings, the post office, the courthouse, and this building, but you got one you already own, and uh, we don't care about that one. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, we'll move on. Uh, we have two items uh, for discussion and possible recommendation to the Common Council. Uh, 2.1 is the presentation by JJR Smith Group on the findings of the Harbor Center Marina Wave Migration Study and possible, possible recommendations to the Common Council um, on selected alternatives. Thank you. Just as a brief uh, point of introduction, you'll recall about a, I don't know, a year or so ago, the um, Council uh, directed staff to go out and uh, hire a consultant or look at coming up with a plan for dealing with 
uh, ice issues at the Harbor Center Marina after we paid somewhere around 350000 for dock damage. Uh, what we did was we went out and wrote a grant to the Wisconsin Historic Wisconsin Coastal Management Program. They're funding 40% of this uh, project. Uh, and then we went on our RFP and hired JJL, JJR consultants out of uh, Madison to put together, commission a study. And what they did was, and you'll see it shortly, is they've uh, developed this model and run different scenarios through this model on wave flows and um, different kind of agitations that are happening in the marina. What we're looking for tonight is really an open dialogue. This is a chance for you to ask them any concerns and questions that I know some of you have asked me over the course of the last few months as to what if we did this, what if we did that. So this is the time to do that after they do a short presentation on their findings and then ultimately um, recommending a selected, selected alternative to the Common Council, um, which once you get to that point, you'll see what the different ones are. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to the team from JGR. They can introduce themselves and their background briefly and then uh, get into the presentation. And then after, there can be some dialogue on uh, questions. One of the things I will say is that uh, the team that worked on it on the city side was uh, Director Beeble, myself, Chris Marks from the marina, and Jim Amodio. Um, so if, and Chris Marks, Dave and I are in the audience, so if you've got any questions for staff on any kind of different changes and stuff at the marina, we'd be happy to address those at the end. So I'll turn it over to JGR. Hello, I'm Margaret Boshek. I'm a coastal engineer with Smith Group JGR. This is my colleague, Bill Bros. Hello, yes, I'm, I'm also an engineer with JGR, and, uh, Vice President, head up our waterfront practice, and uh, have been involved in projects similar to this pretty much my entire career. So we're, we're gonna present the wave mitigation study to you and run through everything that we developed, all the different models that we've used, the results of those models, uh, show you some different uh, alternatives that we have taken a look at, and again, open it up for dialogue when we're done. Okay, so uh, these are your main issues. I'm sorry. I be nice if you could see that. I image. can't quite see it. But what we um, were told was one of your main issues was, of course, the winterization of your dockage. Uh, every winter you sustain um, um, a good amount, a uh, cost amount of damage to your dockage due to the ice uh, encasing in. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, we understand that your dockage is about 30 years old and is original to the marina. Uh, that dockage was supplied by flotation docking systems. And as you can see from the pictures, it is a wooden dock system with wooden skirts that run down the sides of that dock. Um, the center picture and the picture on the right show uh, damage that you received uh, within the past two years. Uh, and that damage is mostly due to the twisting of the ice that has encased the dockage. Um, annually, you are spending about $60,000 in renovations on the dockage. Now, that is not every year. That is an average. In fact, as uh, Chad had mentioned two years ago, you spent close to um, $350,000 in repairs to the dockage, which, of course, is an issue. And uh, that's what we were asked to, to look into. Um, let's see. We also were asked to look into any kind of negative uh, impacts from the dredging that occurred in 2013 by the Army Corps and EPA. Uh, we will talk briefly on that as well. Uh, I'm a little far away. There we go. So um, these were our main tasks. We wanted to perform a bathymetric survey of the marina. We had information outside of the marina that was taken recently by EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers. And outside of the marina and uh, the federal breakwaters, that's all LIDAR uh, information, which is very good and has been taken within the past 10 years. Um, so we, we did that. We established the existing conditions, looking at winds, waves, currents, any type of forcing issues that are happening in and around your harbor and basin. Uh, we deliver, I'm sorry, developed preliminary concepts. We sat down and, and no crazy ideas were off the table as to what we could do to mitigate this issue of the ice encasing your dockage and causing these problems. Uh, we performed numerical modeling of the preliminary concepts that could be modeled, uh, namely agitation and current forcing issues uh, were run through numerical models. 
And then we are, are going to and uh, make some recommendations based on the cost estimates and a cost benefit analysis of all of the concepts that we reviewed. So first with the bathymetry, uh, on the left you can see an image of the orange area which was surveyed most recently uh, by a, an outside consultant. And then we use navigation charts, the Army Corps' own dredge records from 2014, and the LIDAR data that I mentioned. The um, federal channel is dredged to a minimum of about 16 feet, and sometimes is dredged down to uh, 18 to 20 feet. So uh, the federal channel had not been dredged for a number of years, and this was the first time, I understand, within the past 15 to 20 years. And it just happened to coincide with two very difficult winters that uh, we all remember very well. So this is the um, combined uh, bathymetry that we put together through those multiple sources. And this formed the basis of our numerical models moving forward. So you can see it's rather deep uh, outside of those federal breakwaters. But once you're inside, it does shallow up. <coughs> However, the navigation channel, because it is dredged and kept a little bit deeper, the wave energy which uh, penetrates deeper into the water, the longer period waves, can actually penetrate all the way to your entrance, which is located on the south side of that marina basin. So running through the existing conditions, these are the areas that I will focus on, which include the water levels, the waves. We uh, deployed some instruments to get some real data so that we were able to calibrate our models. Uh, we looked at winds, the river discharge, and of course your number one um, issue, which is ice. So looking at the water levels, um, this is uh, water levels from 1918, which is when we started recording water levels. Uh, Sheboygan does not have a tidal station, but these are um, extrapolated from Kiwani and down to Milwaukee. And there's a, a very small difference in between those, those two locations. So you're looking at highs that happened in like 1986, where our water levels were very high, and our lows that were actually happening more recently in 2012 and 2013. Um, the, the highs and lows do play into uh, erosion and things like that, but for a basin study like this, it's not going to change your waves significantly. Um, your water is deep enough that it was, there was no additional shoaling or refraction or anything like that due to water levels. But it's a, it's a nice thing to, to look at, and we use those in our models as well. So your uh, waves, we looked at a offshore virtual wave buoy. Um, there is a system called Wave Information Studies, and it is run by the Army Corps of Engineers. They run a model of the entire uh, Lake Michigan basin, and they pull off points that are then virtual wave buoys. The wave buoys, um, based on these models, are in very good agreement within 5% uh, over the, the years that they've been doing this. And this is a wave rose. What you're looking at on the left side is the directions the waves are coming from. And those different colors uh, correspond to the intensities uh, that you also see on the legend. Now, I apologize this is in meters, but um, I, I'm sure most of us can do the conversion. On the right side, we're only looking at storm waves, which are waves bigger than three meters. And again, this is offshore. Those waves are going to break down by the time they come near shore. But we do see that most of our storm waves are coming out of the north-northeast. Um, we do have the south-southeast waves that are coming in, which, if you remember the, the shape of your basin and your federal breakwaters, those waves are coming through that entrance a bit more unimpeded and are able to impact your uh, southeastern entrance into your marina basin. So we deployed some instruments to collect data for about six weeks. Um, there is an acoustic Doppler current profiler, which records not only water levels, uh, wave directions, and wave heights. And that was located within the entrance of the marina basin. We then put a second wave probe, uh, which is just a pressure reader, so it's only looking at wave heights. It does not include directions, but it also includes uh, water levels. We put that further inside at the end of uh, dock E, which is in the middle of the, the marina basin. Um, now, as you can see from that wave rose that is on the right side, all of your waves, of course, are coming out of the, uh, the east-southeast to southeast, which is to be expected because those are the only waves that can penetrate through and continue on to the marina. So we looked at um, the entire recording, and this is over time of those six weeks. 
We looked at the ADCP, compared it against the wave gauge, and also what we were getting offshore at a NOAA, again, virtual wave buoy. Um, we identified five storms, which are highlighted here, and we then did a calibration study to look at what was offshore and what happened in the nearshore. And what that ultimately did for us, uh, which I guess I'll get back to later, um, but let's talk about winds real quick. Uh, winds are coming out of multiple directions. You're seeing a lot of um, westerly winds and southerly winds. But if you look at just storm winds, then those are relegated to the north, 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 um, east, and the south. I'm sure I'll get to that calibration at some point. Uh, the existing conditions for the river discharge. Now, this is a lot of numbers, and I don't expect you to take it all in, but these are uh, river discharges all the way to 2009. Now, again, the dredging did happen in 2014. We were not able to get those onto a table directly from the Army Corps of Engineers, but we did contact them and get some data, and they are just in line with the rest of the discharges, suggesting that the, the flow did not increase due to this event at all. Um, there's not more water coming down the river. It, it just happens to be uh, deeper. So we'll start to look at ice because that is your number one problem. Now the top table shows the, uh, within the past 30 years, the top five icing events. And you will notice number one was the winter season of 2013 to 2014, which we all remember as being the polar vortex. Um, that created, uh, according to calculations, and now this was not measured, about 20 inches of ice within the marina basin, which is very thick. Um, that ice sheet has its own thermal expansion, it has its own properties, it, it, it had adhered to the dockage and caused a, a number of problems that year. Um, 2014 to 2015, which I don't have damage estimates for, but that was also in the top five, um, ag again, out of the past 30 years. So we would expect a higher than normal amount of damage uh, related to ice. Now, we did have damage expenses that were um, given to us by the, the marina uh, and how much they spent on refurbishing their, their dockage after each of these ice seasons for the past 10 years from 2004 to 2014. Now, if you look at that table very quickly, you can see a correlation between the amount of, of ice that had formed and the amount of damage that they then received. And there is a, a direct correlation with the largest uh, years there, the 2013 and also the 2008, um, being 18 to 20 inches of ice. So it's easy to understand that the thickness of ice is um, a, a big culprit in the damage itself. So I'll go through this very quickly because I realize these images are, are a little unclear. This is the 2013 to 14 season. And from here, we can look at waves, we can look at winds, we can look at ice thicknesses, everything's on this graphic. But if I want to clean that up, I'm looking at four events where you received a lot of damage. And now we're looking for um, correlations between winds directions or waves and damage that you received. And you'll see that the, the wind uh, on some days was very low and the waves were also very low. Um, and at the same time, the direction is not constant or steady. So there's not a direct correlation there. Same thing with the year after where we had also a, a good amount of damage in 2014 to 15. We again see that the, the wind speeds and directions do not have a direct correlation to um, certain events. And if we sum that all up, we're looking at uh, wind speeds that are not only from the south-southwest or northeast, um, but also from the north-northeast in a number of different directions and speeds. So that doesn't tell us that it's one event that causes this problem, um, and it's not a certain wind direction or, or wave. It's an actual ice issue, and we'll get into that. So going into the numerical modeling, what we've done is we created a large-scale model, and that's looking offshore to those virtual wave buoys and taking that information and running it through a SWAN model into the nearshore, which then we have the nearshore wave model on the right side of the screen. We then take that boundary condition, all those waves that we move to the nearshore, and run that again into um, our basin so we have a better understanding of what's happening locally. And that's important. You, you want to start offshore and let the models figure out what's going on because there's a lot of complexities um, in, in water movement. 
So getting back to that calibration study that we did, the uncalibrated storm uh, for a 50-year event, oh, I'm sorry, a, the October 28th storm um, is on the left side. And we can see the uh, time progression of that storm in that table, or I'm sorry, in that graphic on the right side, and that's looking at wave height and also wave period. And period is the time between consecutive <coughs> wave crests. It's the amount of time it takes for a wave to pass. Now, when we calibrated it, we came up with a different model result. And you can see that the wave heights within the basin are a lot better defined. And then we understand how much agitation is uh, leaking itself into the marina basin. So it's important to do this calibrated uh, study. And we learned a lot more about your basin, um, not only for, for this purpose, but for future renovations or adjustments that you might want as well. Uh, so we started to look at the river discharge. Now the river, when it normally is discharging, actually bypasses your marina entrance. Um, there's nothing forcing that currents up into the marina basin. Now when the, the discharges are coupled with a wind, that track um, diverts and heads north. Uh, so when we couple the, the, uh, the currents with the southeast wind, we actually see that a gyre forms where there's currents running inside the basin and along the walls of the inside of your basin. Now the last time we were here, we took some pictures of your basin and such an event had occurred where we had some southeast, wi uh, um, southeast winds coupled with, of course, your river discharges. And that picture on the right side is actually the back side of your, I don't think I can point to anything, but it is actually the north side of your uh, marina basin. And you'll notice that it's actually ice free. And that's because this warmer water that's coming out of the river got diverted into the basin, warmed up the ice and broke it along the edges of your marina basin. Um, that particular event was coupled with a southeast uh, wind which caused waves which good amount of agitation directly into that southeast um, basin entrance broke up a lot of your ice in the entrance as well. So the, uh, the ice fishermen were having a very precarious time walking around out there. So we sat down and talked about some preliminary concepts and how we would combat um, this combination of agitation and currents which uh, turned out to be your main issue. So we, we discussed um, constructing a bin wall under Pier E, which is essentially slicing your marina in half and causing uh, the, the gyre that was forming from the currents to cease because it would be stuck into a much smaller basin. Um, but that does nothing for your agitation issues at your marina entrance. We also talked about placing a gate across the marina entrance, essentially closing your marina completely. Now the best winterization of marinas is when there's no agitation, there's no current, everything just solidifies in that ice and is not allowed to move. That um, prevents any, any damage from occurring because your thermal expansion really isn't enough to, to crush your docks the way that the movement of the ice actually does. So uh, there is that idea. There's the idea of putting a spur just inside the entrance to direct the, the current into another direction. We also talked about opening the northeast corner of the basin to allow um, any currents that entered into the basin to re-exit out of that, that new entrance. Uh, we've talked about extending the existing bin wall that's along the, the channel, the river channel, further out so that those currents actually couldn't turn northward and into the basin. Uh, you can deploy an ice boom throughout your marina so that it adheres onto the ice boom and then the ice sheet is not able to move around. Uh, we also talked about just doing something very simple which was moving all of the dockage, decoupling all of it and putting it into the corner and uh, um, anchoring it there for the winter. But of course that would be labor intensive and with redeploying in the, su in the spring. Uh, so we did not really look at that too much. Uh, one issue that you, you might want to address either way that you go at this is that right now you have cross chains for your mooring bracing. That means that there's a chain on either side of your dockage that's held in between it. When the ice sheet connects around it and that ice sheet starts to move, you're pulling on one anchor or the other. Now if you actually uh, attach your, your anchor chains on either side, when that ice sheet starts to move, it doesn't actually twist the dockage. Um, so that might be a, a, a change that you want to do regardless of which way you um, go forward. So 
There's potentially relocating the entrance to the northeast corner. I talked about all those waves coming in from the southeast. Now your entrance to your basin is also on the southeast, so you're getting a lot of agitation inside your basin. By relocating that entrance, the agitation throughout your basin actually goes down. You don't have an agitation problem in terms of boating activities. It is, it is low enough. But because of the warm waters that are coming out of your river and causing that entrance to be open all the time, relocating that entrance will actually allow that water to cool and your whole basin to ice over. And again, that's its safest condition. Uh, we also looked at uh, de-icers and placing uh, aerators inside your basin underneath your dockage. Uh, the idea of those are they're bubblers or, or they're um, fans of a sort to move the water around that pulls the warmer water into the surface and melts the ice and creates an uh, ice-free environment um, with varied success depending on where you are. And there was also uh, two mentions of um, extending breakwaters around the entrance in a U-shaped and also a J-shaped uh, that was my best description for them that the public had expressed interest in, so we also looked at those. <laughs> now, some problems that we, we, of course, saw with these are putting a gate across the entrance is a, uh, is a permitting <coughs> issue. You're closing off um, a basin completely. There's no flow through, and I know the Army Corps of Engineers would have an issue with that. So permitting was going to be a nightmare with that, that one. Extending a bin wall into a navigation channel is a big no-no for permitting. You would have to redefine the navigation channel, and that's extensive permitting. Um, I don't recommend that you ever go down that, uh, that road. Deploying an ice boom, I understand that this has been tried and was not successful. So we also uh, abandoned that idea and, and didn't go past that. There is also no guarantee that moving all the dockage to one side and securing it was not going to um, still result in some damage to the dockage. So uh, that, that is probably not your best bet to move forward. Um, let's see. Oh, replacing all your current dockage with new dockage. Like I mentioned, it's a wooden system, and it has wooden skirts on the side. Ice adheres to wood. There are other uh, types of materials that ice adhere less to, and those are considered better in an um, uh, ice environment. However, you have a lot of dockage, and replacing that dockage is going to be incredibly expensive. I think when we started to do our numbers, we were coming up with 13 million. Well, not quite that much, but six to seven, I think. Six to seven million. So uh, there, there are definitely some better options out there for you. Um, it's Again, it's recommended to, to change your anchor no matter what. Mm -hmm. So I'll go quickly through these. Looking at uh, the bin wall, we're just looking at currents and the movements through the, the marina basin. Again, we want to make this as calm as possible. So uh, putting that bin wall in there did help... Um, to, to a point, but you did still see some currents running along that, that northern wall. We put a gate across the front, which would close off the entrance completely. What you're seeing are, are just some uh, ghost currents from surface, but once this iced in, um, the surface was not able to be manipulated by wind, so those currents would disappear. But again, gates are um, a, a permitting issue. We have the, the spur on the inside, which actually accelerated um, currents along that back wall, uh, so that did not work quite as well as, as we had hoped. Um, entering, uh, opening the northeast entrance to allow currents to run through and then back out actually was counterproductive as it created an even stronger gyre, um, so that was not a good issue to go through either. So then we came to opening the northeast entrance, as I mentioned, because the <coughs> waves can't get into an entrance that is not its, in its direct line of sight. Um, our currents were way down, and in fact, it was very, very calm. So we started looking at agitation, and when we compare agitation from existing to um, the, the recommended new entrance, we see that the agitation within the basin is also lower, and this suggests that in a winter environment, that whole basin would be allowed to ice in. It is not 100% guarantee, though, so... Um, uh, because uh, warm water can, can come from anywhere. But it is a much better solution than what you currently have. It is also a costly solution, which I'll get into. 
So this is the U-shaped breakwater extension. Now again, this is going into the navigation channel, which I'm sure whoever came up with the design idea wasn't really thinking of now. Um, because of the, the focusing of wave energy, you can see it in the bright red in that image, would be right at your marina entrance. That is not the best place to have um, an entrance because any boats going in and out would be stuck in this elevated wave environment. Now, the other option that the public came up with was this J-shaped breakwater, which is actually a very good idea, um, if not for um, maneuverability. It's hard for, for boats to actually zigzag and get inside a marina, especially if they are sailboats, which um, have a, a much lower maneuverability than power boats. The other problem, of course, with this is it's still in the navigation channel, but it does create a nice calm environment. So the other option we, of course, looked at was um, the deicers and uh, aerators. And this is essentially what they look like. Casco Marine is a um, supplier here in Wisconsin. And we've worked with them in the past, and they have pretty good products that are under warranties, different warranties for, for different machines. But we gave them a call uh, to see what it would cost to aerate your entire basin, still removing two ends of uh, piers that you currently do. You would still want to move those um, in, into the inner basin. And they told us that you would only need <coughs> 28 units. We thought that might be a little low, so we did uh, cost estimates based on 50 units. Um, but essentially what they are recommending is a pole-mounted system, which is all the way in the bottom right-hand corner of, uh, of the graphic there. And those would just directly um, attach to your current dockage and circulate the water in those areas and keep any areas above it within that degree um, ice-free. Now, based on Wisconsin winters, and they know Wisconsin, they, they're here, they believe that, that we can um, turn on these systems occasionally. They don't have to run all the time and that they would be able to keep the ice to a thin enough amount that even if you weren't ice free, the ice is not damaging because it's so thin that, that the movement of that ice sheet could actually uh, break against the docks. Um, I'm not sure if I, I fully got across that. Your, your biggest issue is that this ice sheet is forming around your docks and holding them. And that whole ice sheet is subject to wind uh, forces and also current forces. And as it tries to move, it tries to drag your docks with it. Now your do docks, of course, are fixed to the ground with mooring chains. And that resistance and the movement of that ice sheet is what's causing the twisting and breaking of your docks. So that's what we're trying to avoid here. Now aerating your entire uh, marina basin, of course, would be um, an electric cost, but your capital cost is significantly lower than um, implementing any of these structural solutions that we already talked about, which includes the, the breakwaters and gates and such. So going into a little bit of costing, and this is going to be high level, uh, looking at a 16-foot depth, which is what you have in your basin, in and around your basin, every foot, every linear foot of breakwater is going to cost roughly $4,000. Now, you're looking at over 250 feet with any of these options. Um, now, one of the options of relocating that entrance to the northeast corner, you're actually reusing that rock. So you don't have to purchase new rock, but your costs only go down by about 30 to 35%. So you're still looking at $2,700 per linear foot. And again, that's going to be about 100, 120 feet of, um, of breakwater. Now, comparing that to your de-icers, um, which, of course, are the capital costs of just the system, I costed it out based on 50 units, and your cost is uh, about $46,750. Now, those are based on today's prices. Um, prices change in June, just to let you know, uh, but that's, that's roughly where that cost would be. That does not include the cost of electricity. Uh, or time or labor to install them, to uninstall them, to store them, to maintenance them. Um, that is just the direct cost that you would pay to purchase the systems from Casco. Now, of course, when we compare that to an equivalent breakwater, you're only going to get 11 to 18 feet of breakwater for the same cost. So that's really a, a no-brainer as to if you're looking for um, your first uh, avenue, you want to look at something that is going to give you an open basin uh, for the least amount of money. The aerators are definitely a good way to go. So um, 
It is our recommendation that you look into the de-icers and CASCO has uh, promised me a map of the location of these uh, aerators, but I do not have that yet, so I'm, I'm not gonna give that to you. Um, but they, they are under warranty and they will work with you to set them up and make sure that, that your system is working properly. So the only considerations that you have for these systems um, are, of course, installation and removal. It's more labor. It's going to be more time intensive. Uh, there is, the, of course, the electricity during the winter. You decide how long you want to turn them on. Casco will give you recommendations on, on how long they will need to be run based on the temperatures and uh, forecasting temperatures. You want to store them um, and maintenance them every year. So they are small units, uh, as uh, you saw in the pictures, they're not very large. So that shouldn't be too much of a problem. And you want to have a few on hand as replacements because the worst thing happens in the middle of the winter, one breaks a really rough night and you're going to have ice uh, forming. Now ice is not going to get to seven inches, which tends to be your threshold for, for damage in the marina overnight, that's not gonna happen. But if one breaks down, you're gonna to wanna to replace it in the next week or so, just to make sure your ice is uh, kept pretty thin. Um, now Casco, again, only recommended 28 units. Uh, I costed 50 because it is such a large basin, but for only the 28 units, you are looking at a capital cost of only $26,000. Um, so it is a, a definite good first path forward, um, and, and I would recommend that as the way that you go to, to see if that is gonna help you with your ice concerns. Now we've had an incredibly mild winter this year, uh, which is actually very nice after the past two years. So I don't know what your, your damage has been this year, but I can imagine a little bit of torquing and, and movement, especially due to the storms coming in, has caused you um, a little bit of damage and maybe even 10% of what it would cost to get these aerators. And you can start with a lower number of de-icers and just see how they work. You, the beauty of these is they plug right into your dock utility centers, so there's no expensive wiring or anything. You can <coughs> put them wherever you need them. After ice forms, you can actually turn them on. It gets rid of ice. The only idea is it's bringing up a little bit warmer water to melt the ice. So it's a fairly inexpensive way to start off to see how this all works. And uh, if you need to add a few more down the road, you can always do it. Now you will still get um, agitation events in the winter because you are, the, the river actually allows that, that navigation channel to remain open through most of the winter. So you're still gonna get waves coming in, breaking up the ice that is outside of these aerators. So you will get chunks of ice floating into the hole that is created by these de-icers. However, that ice is so small that even its movement is not enough to damage um, significantly any docks that you that you have okay. does anyone have any questions yes what it I'm sorry what is the uh, the life expectancy or the warranty for each one of these each system is a little bit different so that would be um, Casco would would guarantee their system for a certain amount of time with a, a certain amount of maintenance um, is it five years ten years what what, what is it yes, we'll I have to check on that for you Yes. We can find out. There's a number of different companies that make them. Okay. Casco is the one that we have used mostly in that area for track. <coughs> we wouldn't expect it to be less than five years. Yeah. Any other questions? Don? Yep, thank you. A uh, quick question. You talked about changing the way we tie them down, if you will. Um, is there any benefit to doing that in addition to these aeration systems? Um, or is that, in your mind, cost prohibitive? Um, I think the, the recommendation of changing the mooring system to a knot crossed um, is, is still valuable. Now, if you can keep the, the, the basin open completely throughout the winter, then you don't have that ice sheet moving those docks, and therefore that cross system uh, doesn't matter. And where your, your docks are stable in their current position, if you choose not to, to change the mooring system, uh, as long as the, the basin remains open, you should be fine. Um, but if there's a little bit of ice and that ice sheet starts to move, you will get the, the twisting in those docks. And that's why I think it's, it's recommended that you switch it, but it is uh, labor and, and there are costs associated with doing that. So how many inches of ice does it take to move those moorings? I know it says seven inches for the amount of damage right. that we've seen. That was about the threshold, yeah. 
You what about just to get things moving? I mean, is it three inches, four inches? Well, uh, it would be uh, a force calculation, but yeah, it would be about three inches before it's kind of adhered, and now you have your, your wind running across that ice and forcing it in a direction, um, and it's gonna wanna carry those docks with it. Now, it's not gonna cause damage to those docks because the, the ice is thin enough that it'll start to crush against the dock, um, but it's enough to get things moving around. They want to move when the wind blows. You know, there's, they're above the water surface. And, and this is a great lesson on wind and agitation. I was so looking forward to this tonight. <laughs> um, but the, the, I guess my last question would be these aeration systems that you have, um, how much ice will form with those systems there? So if three inches gets things moving, will three inches of ice form with these agitation systems? in place. There, there is the option of leaving them running for a good amount of time and of course it's uh, a function of the temperature because mm -hmm. if we get another uh, two weeks of negative 20 degrees like we did in, in 2013 you will get ice on the top there it's just because the ice is or the cold water is actually now permeating toward the bottom. Um, the I, I don't know exactly how much ice you're going to end up with, but in which case Casco would recommend that you run them full time. In a mild winter like this, you might turn them on once a night for an hour or two. Do you know what they draw from an electricity standpoint? We did a calculation. Um, this same system we put in in Traverse City, Michigan. It's a little colder climate, uh, 150 slips or thereabouts. There were 48 units. And on a particularly cold winter, I think they used about $13,000 worth of electricity. But they ran them pretty often, and that was 48 units. So I suspect it's probably... It's 350000 in dock repair. Yes, <laughs> it does. And was that a successful... Yep. Yeah, they, 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 didn't, they, just, they didn't sustain damage that year when it was that cold? Uh, it's, I don't have... I, they didn't quantify how much, but they, they kept it open enough that there really wasn't any damage up there. Uh, Lakeshore State Park in Milwaukee uh, has the same thing, so it keeps things open. You know, in terms of the ice question and how much is going to form, this actually keeps it open so no ice forms. Even overnight, if you turn them off and the next day you came in, there's not going to be much ice there. You turn them on, that ice will be gone within an hour. So they, they work pretty effectively. Yes, Jim. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, you, you talked about the gate. How much would the gate cost, and what are the permitting issues? The, the gate runs really close to about $4,000 a foot, ironically, as the breakwater. Okay. Uh, we actually built a gate up in Dorkhouse. We built a small private marina. It was 40, 41 feet of gate, which is about a quarter of what you have here. And the water depth is quite a lot different. It's similar in cost, and permitting issues are tricky because you are state waters, and to block off the state waters with a gate, you have to get a permit for it, obviously. Mm -hmm. And they will set conditions as to how long you can have the gate shut because people will still want to get in here when they can. You know, ice fishermen are, are kind of crazy, actually. I'm, I'm one of them, but fishermen will go out in almost any weather. So it's a matter of when can you shut it, and now you're blocking off the public access to get out of there. So it's, it's a real tricky thing to do, uh, and it would be a, a permitting challenge. And to give you an idea of your marina entrance, it's 175 feet. So you'd need at least 150 feet of gate mm -hmm. across that, and that's going to add up very quickly. Yep. And you would have to deploy it every winter and put it somewhere in the spring. Um, there's a lot of issues there. Just, uh, just a quick question. How long is that permitting? A couple times you've referred to this uh, permitting. We've all uh, worked with the DNR um, in various shapes and capacities. How long is that permitting process? To actually get a just, permit? Just as a follow-up, I had a discussion with the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard, would all, they said they won't allow that to happen because of the issue of if they have to do any kind of emergency rescues in the winter, they have to get through there. So the Coast Guard said that Okay, so it would be never then. <laughs> yeah, that would be never then. For that specific, yeah, concept, yes. Any, any other questions? Seeing none, 
Uh, thank you for the information. And again, this is uh, basically for discussion and, uh, and review. If anybody wanted to make a motion on this, uh, on any of these recommendations, they can. Yes, Chad. What we would ask for is a recommendation on whatever we you believe is the preferred um, alternative, which you know staff is recommending as well as the consultants, the de-icing uh, plan. And what we would like to do is. Um, be able to have the council bless something so we can finalize the report and then staff will work with the purchasing department to go out and develop a more comprehensive plan on how this would be employed and what the cost would be in bidding and all of that kind of stuff and bring it back to you uh, for final rec final approval at a later meeting. But just as a follow-up, Chris has said that there is minimal damage this year. Um, Given the, the weather conditions, there's, they're going to have to hire a welder to come in and do some um, minor work. Uh, but So I believe we've skirted a year that we don't have a ton of costs, so we've got some time to get this implemented, and the goal would be to get this plan in place for next year's uh, winter season. So we've got enough time between now and then to develop a final layout plan and work with the vendor to get to something that's going to work for us. Thank you. Yes, Don. I would move that we accept their recommendation and ask staff to put together a, um, a budget and um, scope of work for this project and bring it back to the council. Second. Okay, we have a first and a second. Um, all in favor? Discu oh, discussion, sorry. No discussion. I have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? Motion is approved. Thank you. We'll go into uh, 2.2 presentation um, by the by Bray Architects on the City Hall uh, use study and possible recommendations to the Common Council. Yes, John. Um, thank you, Chairman. I'd just like to, to kick this off. Um, uh, for those of you that don't know, I am the building use chairman and um, about uh, this past summer we convened the, the committee and started looking at all sorts of different um, alternatives and options and what preceded this was a study by um, ZS consultants uh, who looked at this facility and uh, we knew that there were Significant deficiencies in maintenance that needed to, you know, needed to be done, and we needed to figure out what the entire scope of that work was going to be. And once we received this report, uh, then the building use committee was formed, and it was determined that um, are, are we going to stay in this building? Are we going to are we going to just vacate it and leave it? Are we going to build a, a new city hall? Are we going to look at existing buildings within the city to relocate? And, uh, and, and what kind of space needs do we have? So uh, it, it became kind of overwhelming a little bit for the committee with all these different moving parts. And so what we decided to do was um, contract with Bray and do a uh, building use study and figure out what is the actual needs of square footage of, of uh, City Hall, what is required to run in the most efficient way possible, and can this building, in fact, be... Uh, reconfigured in such a manner as to accommodate the efficiencies that we're looking for. Um, and so they, they were going to look at the, the space needs and, and look at this existing building as well as um, other buildings within the city and other um, lots or land that the city does own to, to purchase or to, to uh, construct a new city hall. So um, it's been quite a, a lengthy process. But uh, Bray Architects did a fantastic job, and uh, they've got a great presentation. So um, I'd like to introduce Steve and Mike, and they'll go ahead and provide the presentation, and there'll be questions afterwards, and we'll go from there. So right. thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. <clears throat> and again, I'm, I'm Steve Cunin. I'm a principal with Bray, local firm here in town. Uh, hopefully most of you know of us. Uh, we also have offices in Milwaukee. But this was an easy trip, five minutes and we're here. It's great to be here. 
Um, also with me is Mike Hacker. Mike's an associate with our firm. And uh, we were the, the primary uh, architects involved in this, although a lot, uh, a lot others helped. And as John had mentioned, um, it's, been a, it's been a lengthy process, but I think a very good one. We started out um, well, probably, I think, six, five, six months ago. And we sat down and um, kind of took a fresh look at this and looked at, um, first of all, interviewing all of the staff to make sure that we had their needs, uh, their needs and their requirements appropriate. And then we turned that into a programming sheet, which tells us kind of how, how big we really need this space to be. And, and I'm not going to go through that um, uh, here, but, but just to, to let you know that the, a new building would be about 25,000 square feet. And that's to accommodate those um, departments that you have in this building here. And this building right now, including the basement and the mezzanine and all the spaces, is about 39,000 square feet. So we've got some extra square footage in this building for what those needs are. Um, and so that, but that program then um, created the basis for our moving forward and then looking at different sites um, and then putting some costs to those. And I'm going to turn it over to Mike, and he's going to just run through kind of the process that we used in, in looking at sites and, and uh, eliminating some sites and continuing to look at some sites. And then we'll, we'll look at, at um, what this building might be if it were to be renovated. So, Mike? Sounds great. So we thought we would do is start up by um, showing you what's on the screen here, which is the draft study document, and I believe that's been sent out uh, and is available to go through in detail. And we thought we'd just take a minute and give you an overview of how that's structured, give you a little bit of the methodology behind uh, our process uh, for going through this effort, and then uh, I'll take a minute and just talk about the how we uh, achieved the space total square footage, as Steve just noted, uh, and then Steve will take it over from there and talk a little bit more about the different sites that we that we took a look at. So. The study document is really broken into two uh, main components, okay? So what you'll see once you uh, get into that and uh, under tab one is the space program, which is what I'm going to talk about in a second. Tab two really looks at the site analysis. And again, we studied a, a series of different sites in and around uh, the city, uh, as well as this existing building. And we have a little bit more, uh, a couple of exhibits to take a look at uh, relative to that. Uh, from there, then, number three will is kind of a TBD, but that's a recommendation. So we'll complete that piece coming out of this conversation tonight as uh, a recommendation is made to, uh, to the Common Council. And then uh, to complete the documents, just an appendix with a, a bit more uh, information in it. Okay. Um, so tab one, the program need. We always start out by uh, first and foremost defining who we are today. Okay, and so we spent some time really studying the existing city hall building, uh, the different departments and the different organizations that make up the building. Okay, so uh, this is a site plan, so you can see uh, the city hall building to the south as well as the garage uh, immediately north of that. We then do uh, uh, organization diagrams for, for each of the floors, okay? And so this color code, uh, it's kind of small, but on the bottom really uh, outlines all the different departments that make up uh, the City Hall administration uh, and ultimately the departments that went into the space program that we'll talk about in a second here, okay? So we have this organization here for the uh, basement level, uh, the first floor, second floor, third floor, which is uh, the floor we are on, and then the fourth floor, which is the uh, mechanical mezzanine, just a small penthouse at the top of the building there, okay? Um, as we went through this, it's clear that this building is uh, really of, of vintage, uh, very common for city halls at the, this time to be designed in this manner, really where departments were spread out and sprinkled throughout the building, okay? Uh, limited public space. Uh, the vast majority of the space in this building uh, is uh, dedicated to, to private office space. Uh, it also is difficult from a wayfinding standpoint, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that just from a, uh, citizens uh, as they come into the building as a patron, um, kind of the ease of, of the services we're providing them. So how, how uh, simply are they getting answers to their questions and achieving tasks uh, while they're in the building? Okay, and right now it's pretty difficult. You have to rely on signs. You have to traverse multiple floors uh, as well as um, uh, into the basement at times. Okay, so um, we'll, we can come back to that uh, and speak to that in more detail. So as Steve noted, this space program, it's very small here, and I can certainly zoom in if there are specific questions, but is organized by those color-coded departments. Okay, so what you'll see is uh, admit, uh, attorney's office, clerk's office, planning and development, uh, and so on. And what you're seeing uh, in the far left column 
is the uh, existing square footage by room. Okay, so we start by organizing by department, and then within that department, we further break that down by the different spaces that make up that department, the offices, the storage rooms, uh, any open work station environments uh, that may accompany that. Okay, and then have listed, as I noted, the existing square footage, and then through uh, interviews with, with department heads, through a survey exercise, have uh, forecasted a, a projected need for each of those departments, again, broken down by those specific rooms. Okay, and so in some cases you'll see uh, the rooms are right sized. Okay, so uh, we've taken a, an office and, and adjusted the size of that relative to what we uh, would project the need moving forward for that to be. Uh, in some cases we've looked at opportunities to consolidate things like record storage and maybe a, and doing some electronic scanning to downsize some, uh, some of our current storage need. Uh, and then in some cases, we actually identified spaces either we don't need moving forward or vice versa, spaces that we don't have today that we do think we need moving forward. Okay, and that's uh, clearly organized by department as you go through, through the building. Okay, when you get to the, the, the last sheet, it's important to note at the bottom, uh, for us, we look at two different types of square footage. Okay, the first is a net square footage, the second is a gross square footage, okay? And so when we talk about the difference between those, the net square footage is really gonna be our program square footage, okay? That's the that's a inside wall to inside wall dimension of each of the rooms. Uh, a net square footage does not take into account like circulation hallways, janitor's closets, it doesn't take into account mechanical chases, right? Things that you need in a building but are not dependent uh, department by department, okay? So really when we're comparing need today versus need tomorrow, outside of a solution, okay, and not looking at a design yet, not looking at renovating a building yet, really just comparing those, we're looking at the net square footage, okay? And right now, we believe that the net square footage of the existing building, per this analysis, is about 13,500 square feet, okay? And the projected need moving forward uh, is about 18,200 square feet, okay? So about a 4,700 square foot difference, growth, in net square footage, okay? Uh, about half of that falls into a shared category, actually, the last category uh, in the space program. And, and that directly relates to uh, a shift in model, a shift in approach that's more a public-centered design. Okay, So it's more shared space. It's taking, taking a lot of the, the hidden spaces, the conference rooms that are tucked around this building, and bringing them to the front, increasing them in size, and, and allowing the public to access them uh, more frequently. Okay, And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. So... Uh, before I dive into that, are, are there any specific questions about the space program, the process for that, or, or ultimately square footage? Yes, Don. Um, dumb question. Not an, archi oh, Not an architect. Um, didn't play one at home. We have much less staff now inside this building um, by a significant amount, but you're saying we need four, almost 4,000 more square feet um, to do the functions of City Hall. Is that what I'm hearing? That's correct. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. And as I know, about half of that growth, so the majority of that growth, uh, is really in uh, shared space. So it's uh, meeting rooms, conference spaces, this council chambers uh, in particular. Um, and I can identify those more here here in a second. Yes, Marilyn. Um, <clears throat> I did. I had the same question um, in terms of decreasing staff and also efficiencies in terms of use of space, why we grossed up to, to that extent. Um, in your opinion, can either City Hall be remodeled? Well, that's redundant, but the other building sites that you're proposing, could we go with the um, net area of 13,540 instead of going up to 18,000 and still do what we need to do as a city? Yeah, that would obviously. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't think so. Based on unless we decrease elements of that program, um, and I think part of the difference also comes in in just how we, how we, um, uh, kind of figured things, uh, and and it comes down to to sort of some nitty gritty like a like a typical workstation would be eight feet by ten feet, where now it might be four feet by six feet, and some of that. Um, some of that, uh, the space that they used to work with is in file cabinets or something. And so, so it's, it's, we try to be as apples as ap apples to apples as possible, but, but we're really, but we're really not apples to apples. 
So I think the, the difference the, the th between the 13 and the 18 is not quite as large of a range as, as it appears on the paper. And just what I would note is that um, <clears throat> the mayor's suite of offices um, is large. Um, the, the secretarial area is, is quite substantial. We have open space over here. We have our, our uh, planning and development department in a, a very inefficient kind of configuration. Um, and so those are the, those are the, the just as, as I'm looking at it, it, I'm just wondering if, if, if we couldn't do a net area that was perhaps a, a little bit more uh, reasonable. And Don, just a thought. I mean, no. I'm not arguing with okay. you. Yep. And, and maybe you're going to get to this. Um, so I, I don't want to badger this issue, but you know, shared meeting spaces, you know, shared conference rooms, all that shared space. Um, is that design? Are you talking about shared like for the general public? Or are you talking yeah. more in line with? Because we have the library that we have those abilities to do. Um, you know, those types of things. I'm just again just trying to wrap my arms around. Do we have an estimate per? Square foot. I, I'm sure there's numbers in here somewhere, because um, you kind of made the comment that you know 4,000 square feet isn't all that much more, but multiplied by a cost per square foot, you know, it's probably yeah. going to be real dollars. Yeah, yeah, noted. Yeah, and when we made that reference, it's really more um, as we would compare that to other clients and other studies of this type. That growth is, um, I would say, uh, relatively small compared to the the right sizing that we deal with with a lot of similar clients so that was what that was in reference to so uh, this might help answer that a little bit so w what we put together here was a graphic it's really a, an adjacency diagram to help try to communicate the the public service model uh, of a city hall um, uh, that differs a bit from how the current city hall is set up today and so this is not really meant to be architecture it's not meant to look like a floor plan but it is meant to uh, give you a perspective of of scale as well as uh, kind of uh, adjacent and some traffic flow. So what, what you're seeing here uh, on the top in a little bit darker shade of yellow uh, is all of the uh, staff space, okay, all of the department space we referenced uh, just a second ago. Uh, the size of the individual uh, department box or rectangle uh, is proportionate to its uh, square footage. Okay, so you can compare uh, one department to the other uh, in a quick glance. Okay. Uh, we also spent some time uh, as we worked with the staff talking about who the departments work with most. Okay, one of the key goals here would also to be uh, to find a layout of the building that really maximized the efficiency of the staff time while they're in the building. Okay, so uh, we studied what departments are they working with frequently? Are there ways that we can either uh, combine or, or uh, locate those adjacent to one another so that the staff movement is minimized as much as possible? And so some of the arrows you're seeing between the departments are representing some of, of that movement. Uh, you can see here planning and development. A, a number of the departments go to planning development. Okay, so finding the right location for them is going to be key to to this study, um, as well as uh, the city attorney. Obviously, uh, is a key component within uh, the uh, interdepartmental working. Okay, so I, I think the key component in this diagram really is these spaces as it relates to the public space. Okay, and that's the little bit lighter color to the bottom of the image. Uh, or combination of colors there. And so what you're seeing there is a, uh, a simplified movement as much as possible for uh, any of our patrons or public that come into the building. So the goal here really is that uh, through one or, or possibly multiple entrance points, uh, we simplify the lobby space as much as possible and attempt to find uh, a limited number of uh, transaction points within the building that they need to ultimately find. Okay, so the ideal scenario uh, as you see here, would be one informational desk. Okay, this would be a desk that very much is uh, staffed by uh, a, cr a cross-trained group of individuals that is really there to, to answer 90% of the questions that, that arise at the front desk. Oftentimes today, somebody comes in to complete one task, they may have to go to two to three different departments to complete that one task. Ideally, all of those can be completed at this one counter. Okay. The other piece to that is that instead of bringing the public back into the staff environment, into the private environment, we're bringing the, the, the uh, excuse me, the public back into the staff environment. We're bringing the, the staff up to the front to the public. Okay. And so what you're seeing uh, just on the left and the right of the informational desk uh, would be a couple conference rooms potentially. Okay. And those, as identified in the uh, space program, would be located in a way that the public could get access to them and our staff uh, as well from, from their side of the building. Uh, then outside of uh, and around the lobby would be uh, a series of other 
public accessible spaces. Uh, it would be this council chambers as well as some of the other meeting rooms uh, associated with, with the program. Okay, and so ideally this is done in a way too that the private side or, or the staff side of the building could be closed off on nights and weekends and, and we could in fact allow uh, uh, public access in and, and the ability to even rent out spaces uh, uh, in the evenings or on, on the weekends. Okay, so it starts to shift the thinking of City Hall from, from just what happens in meetings like this to more of a public accessible space. I will say to answer your question, we were not charged with uh, overlaying this to uh, some of the other city-owned buildings and you know uh, kind of associated spaces so we did not study the need identified here compared to the similar space types at the library or in other buildings so that was not a part of this this analysis thank you so with that said the next step of the process was to start to look at a series of different sites yeah, so we, and hopefully I can read these. Um, we, we looked at, <clears throat> we, we worked with, the, with our uh, steering committee to uh, come up with uh, sites that the city already owns, and then a, a couple of even additional ones that we just, uh, there was some interest in looking at those. And so we came up with, I think it was nine sites, was it Mike? Yeah, so, so the, uh, the diagram here uh, is showing those sites within the, the downtown area. We, we wanted the sites to be a close, as close to the downtown as possible, and so we really, uh, we really um, uh, focused on on those sites. Um, the uh, and we labeled each one. Uh, the first one is the tenth in Wisconsin, which is which is the site uh, uh, along the river, um, right next to the the Garden Toy Building, and um, a good sized site. Um, uh, so we, I'll tell you what, what I'm going to do is, is kind of go through all these and then we'll go through them in a little bit more detail. So this, is, this just shows all the nine sites. The, number, the first one was the 10th of Wisconsin. The second one was the, uh, the Mead Library uh, building and we looked at, at, at two areas on that. Um, the third one was the existing city hall. Um, the fourth was the oh yeah, parking lot west of Stefano's. Uh, the next was the immediately north of that. Uh, the seventh, the, the next one was seventh uh, in New York. Uh, Sheboygan. Sheboygan Press, and and then and then finally the Nemshoff Building. So, so the the ones that are up here in the in the red are 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 sites that kind of made the cut. The other the other ones in the pink did not make the cut, and we'll kind of talk about some of the reasons that that they didn't. So. So as we get into the, this, uh, this is the attempt at Wisconsin site. It's showing, we wanted to look to, to test the sites to see if a building in fact could fit on there, a building of the size that we programmed. And given that this is the largest site, um, we, we looked at this as a one-story building. It could be two, it could be three, but we wanted to see what kind of the worst case scenario, if, there were, if this were one site, would it still fit? And you can see that it's, it really fits pretty nicely on the site, a corner site. Uh, we also wanted to see if, if in the future, uh, you know, there was there was some thought that maybe a fire station uh, would occur in this area. Would it fit a fire station? So that's why you're seeing a fire station there. That wasn't really part of the study, but we did that as an exercise to see if, in fact, it could support a fire station, and it does. I and mean, there's no surprise here. Uh, this this is a really good site. The other thing about this site is that it's got it's on a nice prominent axis um, on uh, to the downtown. It sort of lines up nicely. Uh, on this axis, and if you continue to go east, you would end up at the uh, at the John Michael Kohler Art Center. So it's it's a nice, from a from a tying it into the downtown, we thought that was a nice element. Uh, the next site um, is the this is the existing library site where we looked at the uh, northwest corner. Um, this this we thought was was kind of a nice site because it's it creates kind of the civic presence. We've already got the the fountain here, and we thought we would face the building onto the fountain and really. <laughs> Uh, uh, create a civic plaza in a way there, and um, it would allow allow parking. We, we're taking some of the parking away, but but uh, it would have accessible parking that is now uh, in existence for the uh, for the library and such. Um, so then we we looked at at uh, the existing city hall, and um, we looked at the at the existing parking building or not parking structure, but it was parking for the police department. And we said, let's get rid of that. That building is really, there wasn't a whole lot of use for that. And we could turn that into, into additional parking space or potentially plaza space. Turn the, the 
uh, main entrance of the building around, and we'll get into that when we get into the design of the building, but, uh, but we really looked at, at in increasing the, uh, once again, the civic presence of this building. Um, this is the building, or the site in uh, just to the west of uh, Ilra Trobo. We thought this, the city owns this. We thought this had some, some positives to it. It's on kind of a main, uh, it's got a, a main uh, a visual as you come into town. Um, it's right across from the school district. Uh, there, there's, there seems to be adequate parking there. Um, but the, just the, the access to this really became a negative. You know, how do you get to it? Um, uh, you need, sort of need to weave through the streets and, and make some, f some funny turns. And so, um, but we kept it on the table. So uh, this was the, and this, this was the site adjacent to the, to the previous site on uh, 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 what is it, Pennsylvania Avenue. And we thought we kept the same issues as the other one, better access, probably better street presence in a way. Um, but uh, I think the committee felt that this might be a better, this site may, might better be used for uh, some sort of retail or office size, space. So, but again, we kept it on the table. Um, so those, so those are the, those are the, the sites that made the cut. Um, some of the other ones that we looked at, for instance, the press building um, was was discounted just because that would probably need as much, if not more. Um, renovation than as this building does and we weren't it's, it's privately owned and uh, so there are some issues with that we looked at the at the Nemshoff building downtown um, which is privately owned the city would need to uh, lease that space or cut a deal with them we just felt the floor plate was not working well for what uh, for what you have in mind in terms of uh, in terms of this new approach to delivering your services and then we also looked at the site um, that is adjacent to the uh, the old uh, uh, Prangy site or, or coal, uh, a Boston source site, and and it was just felt that while it was a prominent site, it w there were better uses for that in terms of some retail or something that would would uh, would service the, the the new apartments there in that green space. So so that was kind of taken off the table at that point. I think I got them all. Oh yeah, southeast of the Mead. This one was uh, that the kind of the the. the, the a fairly tight site, and we need to get so close to that building, and with the building codes and and uh, uh, you know the firewalls we'd have to create, and just the the, the lack of space there it would it would have to be a three-story building, uh, maybe even four, and it, it was just felt that that was not the best uh, the best area to put a building because of what it would do to the library and the presence of the library there. So, any other any questions on that? I, I kind of breeze through that. We're asked to give the Reader's Digest the approach, so. <laughs> Any questions on those sites or anything? No? Okay. All right, okay. Continue. Okay, so should you, why, why don't we uh, just jump into this building then. Um, <clears throat> every, every site we looked at, um, we looked at, a, at about a 25,000 square foot building. So the footprints you were, you were looking at were either a one story, I think in some of the smaller sites we went to a three story, or a two-story, the, the, so we, we, we tested out a number of different um, building masses on those sites, although they were all within that 25,000 square foot range. And each of those, when we put a cost to them, was somewhere between 6.8 and 7.6 .6 million dollars. The difference being primarily in the site and the development of the site. Um, some of them would need more parking, some not as much parking, and so, the building costs themselves we're, we're really standard on the 25,000 square feet. We know is we know what a building of that size is going to cost. So there's not much difference there at all. It's really really comes down to the site. You know, the other so. note there is that first site where we showed the fire station footprint that was just a test fit on the site. The cost did not reflect the construction of the fire station on that site. So just to, just to note that. Yeah. Thanks. So so. Wait a second, question. Jim. Uh, when you're coming up with those uh, costs, in six to seven million dollar range, <clears throat> uh, what are you taking in, in, into consideration as far as building materials, finishes inside the building? Would you compare that to a Rolls yeah. Royce, uh, a Cadillac, or a Chevrolet? You know, if you can put it in, in those kind of terms, sure. of what we're getting for the money? <clears throat> yeah, that's a great, great question. What we did is we we never designed. Mercedes Benz, or you know, we, we just never get that kind of a budget, even though we'd love to. But I would say that this is probably more of a Chevy, 
And I say that the, the prices that we came up with are based off of um, recent projects that we've done in, in similar, similar communities. We did one down at Oak Creek, it just opened. Um, we just finished a project in uh, St. Francis, which just opened about a year ago. Um, uh, we, what was another one? Those, oh yeah, Mount Pleasant we did probably about five years ago. And so, so we've taken that historical data, and these are hard bid numbers, and we, we projected that onto, onto what this might be. And, and all of those buildings are um, functional first and foremost, but they're also, uh, they have materials that are, um, I would say, nice enough to, you know, that people in the community can be proud of. Um, they're brick. They're uh, solid, good construction. In some cases, there might be a little stone, um, but they're they're not uh, they're a good, solid, uh, nicely aesthetic building that any community would be proud of, and uh, and that would last a long, long time. So, yes, Jim. If I could, if I could follow up now, the, I sat in in your first presentation, uh, and after I thought. Uh, you mentioned those three communities. Now, I imagine those communities had existing buildings. Why did they all decide to go with new construction rather than e either expanding? Maybe you can give them some reasons why they decided to go new versus remodeling their existing buildings. Because I thought it was kind of <clears throat> ironic because you were suggesting, you know, basically gutting this building and starting over, but your three clients that you brought as examples all decided to go new. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of different reasons. Oak Creek, for instance, they, they were part of a development group that, um, that it was, was going to create an entire new downtown. If you're familiar with it, it's, it Oak, Creek, uh, bought, Oak Creek with a development group, a, a private and, and public partnership, bought, um, it was over 100 acres of the old Delphi battery plant. And they said, we want to create a downtown. They didn't have a downtown. And the, and the building they were in, um, while it was functioning okay, um, it, it was in a bad location, and uh, it was, they were a growing, a, a growing community, and they, they knew they were going to get larger. And so they decided to participate in this, uh, this new venture to create a new downtown where they were going to be the kind of the jewel in that downtown and the anchor in that downtown. So, so it was a completely different way of thinking. Um, uh, St. Francis, in their case, they actually had a... They, they had a building that was a, had a police station and a fire station in it. They were in a landlocked um, uh, 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 environment where they couldn't, there was nowhere to expand. Um, otherwise, we probably, and we did look at, at, at renovating the building, and it would have been fine for the city hall, but, but the fire station and the police station were it was just too small. And so they, they chose to move off-site and build a new, a new uh, facility. And then finally, Mount Pleasant, um, Mount well, Pleasant was a little bit different. They, um, they were growing, another growing community uh, down in Racine County. Um, they uh, needed more space, um, and they also happened to be on a very prominent corner of, of the, the street they were on. It was a, a very desirable to a developer. And so they were able to sell that property to a developer for top dollar. And and walk away from the building, it was demolished, and then a developer took it over and built retail and uh, I forget what else they did. So, so it was kind of a win-win situation. And I wouldn't even mention that they also got a $10 million donation, which sort of helped, helped them uh, <laughs> make that decision. So, okay. I will just add quickly that we have worked with other communities where we have done uh, addition renovation scenarios. Uh, the village of Del uh, the Forest right now, just outside of Madison, Smaller community, a little bit smaller building, but we are looking there. Uh, we just completed drawings on a, an addition and full renovation. There, uh, the building did not have the historic value that this one does, but it had the location value. Okay, so it was in an ideal spot within that community. Similarly, um, the uh, city of Dell Field, just outside, just west of Milwaukee, there we uh, did a full renovation of their city hall, but we added a library onto it. Again, the building did not have the uh, architectural uh, historic value. Uh, but again, that was a, kind of a key anchor in their down, their existing downtown, so it had kind of a location value to it. So every client's a little bit different, uh, and it's really about finding the right solution for that client. Thanks, Mike. And I should mention one other. Um, it's right next door, the Sheboygan Falls. We just, um, you know, we just renovated and added on to their existing city hall, 
they also have a police station connected to it and the fire station. And so we went through the same process with them, and they decided to go ahead and, and uh, renovate and add. So. Okay. Any other questions? So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna show you kind of our proposal or idea for turning this building into a uh, we'll say a 21st century state of the art city hall and um, the all the projects that we've designed have this this um, idea of this we, we call it a one stop shop and the, the and the ultimate idea is that a, peop, a person comes into the building they may have never been here before they go there's one place they can go to and, and they're directed then either to a to the department or generally they'll call up and the department will come to them or the, the, the representative they, they need to see and so that was a challenge it's a tr it's a challenge in any multi-story building um, but what we thought is when we took a look at this building we 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 thought what what was this lacking um, to to accomplish that in this regard and one of the things that it is lacking is this this connection between all the different um, uh, departments they're all kind of spread out throughout the building and there's no you can you come in and there's a there's a receptionist there but she's only there sometimes and you really don't if you don't if the receptionist isn't there you're sort of lost and you usually end up at the clerk's office and so um, so. And, and it's a little intimidating to walk up the stairs if you've never been here before. So we thought if we could, if we could somehow open this, open this whole building up, take down the walls, and, and sort of create a more transparent feel to this, that we could, you could start to visually see what was happening when you walked into the building, that would be a good thing. And so um, the other thing we looked at are all this, the different safety and ADA issues. You know, you have the ADA ramp in the, in the front of the building. Um, and it's 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 usable. People can do it, but it's pretty intimidating if you're in a wheelchair and you're parking across the street and you have to come in and find out where that thing starts and where to go up. And it's it's really not a very pleasant experience, as, as I'm sure you all know. Um, we also wanted to make sure that the building, because it is an icon and it's and it, it's it's uh, it's been here for a hundred years, that we didn't change the look of the building significantly. That we really stayed, you know, kept it in in its in its uh, current form. So, so we thought. Let's let's turn the building around. Let's create a new entryway um, off of the, the the north side of the building, um, which would allow us to get some parking back there. It would allow us to to, um, to solve most of the ADA issues getting up to the building, um, and it would allow uh, it would be an opportunity to to demolish some of the the worst part of the exterior of the building, which is that north side, which is crumbling, and 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 take that down create a glass wall that's kind of contemporary, but we'd make it so it fit, you know, it fit the, the, the building um, with some divided lights and that kind of thing. But that would allow us to get some light to, to spill into the, into the building and just open the whole thing up and start to, uh, start to create um, a better visibility within the building, a better environment for the people who, who, uh, who work here as well as a better environment for the people who visit here. And, um, it was not without some challenges. We thought, uh, you know, we started to look at can we save some of these walls or can we, and, and really it came down to probably a, a, the, the most efficient way to reconfigure this building is to just kind of strip it down to, to the structure. There's not a whole lot in here, and I hope I'm not offending anybody, that is worth keeping from a, a planning, a, a space plan um, Idea. There's a lot in terms of the details, like the wo the wood windows, uh, you know, some of the trim work and that kind of thing. The the stair is 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 uh, is awesome, and we would we would want to keep that. And we'd want to work around that. <coughs> above here, I don't know if many of you know it. Maybe you do, but there's a, a beautiful stained glass window above this this ceiling. It's um, and there's a skylight above that. We would we would anticipate <coughs> revisiting that, bringing that back in. Um, so anyway, all those things kind of got us to to uh, to come up with the plan that we've got here today. And again, the, the key is that that new entrance off of the south, that verticality, um, and then the opening it up to the to the to the uh, different the different departments visually. And, um, so one of the ways we did that, working working with the structure and the stair as kind of our, our and the and the exterior skin as our um, as our starting point. 
we thought if we were to, you know, we could, we've done this in other buildings where we've cut atriums out of the floor and it starts to create some, uh, some of that, that vertical expansion. So we, we, that's what we're looking at here. Maybe we cut out, um, we, we just drew, drew a circle there. The circle relates to the outside and the inside and starts to cut away some of those floors which allows some natural light into the building. We know that um, because of the extensive renovation we're going to do, and just for safety and security, we, we want to get rid of those um, uh, fire escapes. And so we're going to need to build some stair towers. So we, th we said, well, we're going we're to do some major demolition on, this, on the north side anyway. Let's build those safety towers, those safety stair towers in there. We know we wanted to get a new elevator because the elevator doesn't work very well. It, it doesn't uh, hold a gurney, so it's not as safe as a new one. So let's, let's take, take that stair tower and create an uh, 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 elevator within that as well. So now we've got this central core of our, our main stair, our, our exit stairs. Um, we've got it all up to, to, to code. Anyone in a wheelchair can come in, take the elevator to any stair, and they can get anywhere in the, in the building on whatever floor they're in. They could even get to the basement um, uh, as well. Um, and it also allows us to, uh, um, to, to, to just kind of separate that, the, the core space where the public generally goes from the, from the, uh, uh, the office space. So, um, along this, this uh, on the first floor, what you would do is you could come in either from the north side or the south side. You would, you would hit a, uh, a counter that would be, um, we're showing it off of the clerk's area, but it could be staffed by someone who is, is sort of a general person that would direct you either across the way to the, uh, to the purchasing. What we found in our, in our research was that the purchasing and, and city clerk had the most um, visitors, so we put them on the first floor. Uh, the second floor then would be, um, we'd move up to the second floor and we would have our uh, inspection and uh, planning, uh, community planning uh, services. And right now they're separated, yet they do a lot of things together. So we put them together and you'll notice the, again, the, uh, a lot of the <coughs> meeting rooms are along the perimeter. So a person coming to the, to the facility wouldn't necessarily have to go into the office space. They could go into the office. Someone from the office goes into the conference room or the meeting space and they can collaborate there. And so it, it's, it's a little bit more of a, a, a safety feature for those who are working here. Um, but again, on the, so this would be the second floor. Um, and then the third floor, this would, would be the, we'd, we'd renovate this space, open it up again. That, that wall there um, was added. So this would become... Uh, kind of the, we, we'd restore it to the way it was. Take the ceiling out, create the, bring in the, or, or restore the, the existing stained glass. Reconfigure this so that um, all the older persons would be on the dais. And that's what we see in just every, I, I don't think we've ever designed one the way it is designed here, which is more like a, a state assembly or, or senate. Um, so, so we would have the we would have space for uh, the new amount of all the persons, which is ten, the mayor, um, their their staff, and then the audience would be facing them. Um, it would be all set up with technology, etc., uh, the sound systems and things. We have space for the staff off to the side. Um, the mayor's office would be on this floor as well. The mayor and the city administrator would have uh, uh, a conference room that could be shared, similar to what they do now if they go into closed session, that sort of thing. Um, and then we actually, and, and here you'll see where we've got this extra space in this building. We, we've just, uh, it's sort of on the, I, I think as you're looking at it, it's on your left side. That would be um, extra space that we could either put maybe the, uh, the department, the, the engineering department or the public works department um, staff, or we're, we're showing it as maybe the, uh, uh, the W, uh, the, the, the local cable channel comes over there and, and uses it. It's just sort of space that's left over that we didn't have uh, we didn't have anything programmed for. Now on the converse, down in the basement, we've also got that situation. There's a lot of square footage in the basement. We're showing that. We're, we're, right now we've got the, um, uh, the IT department down there. Um, but you can see there's a lot of space up there too. That's just, uh, right now we're just calling it storage because we don't have any other use for it. But this is where you get, um, if you do go this route, you get that benefit of some extra extra square footage that would not be programmed in the, any of the new buildings. So, so I hope I, if there are any questions, I'd be 
right? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, the, 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 the rendering. This is just a, an idea of what this might look, at, look like. And again, it, we didn't show the front of the building because you all know what that looks like. We would enhance the front, um, but it would stay pretty much the way it is. This is actually taken, taken from um, 9th Street looking south, and so, um, which is a pretty heavily traveled area. Uh, that, that is, since it's facing north, it brings in beautiful north light into the building, and again, it would act as kind of a, uh, this, this lantern that would draw you into, into, the, uh, into the city hall. So, and, and the idea here would be that we would, anything that we would add, we would pick up on the detailing that you have in the existing building. So, all right. Thank you, gentlemen. Any questions? Yes, Don. Um, actually, a couple. Um, not to be a pest, sorry. Um, <laughs> what you guys proposed up here, what's the cost of that? Did I miss that? Yeah, I'm sorry, we didn't say that. That would be, um, our estimate is a range of about 10.5 to 11.1, I believe. Okay. Um, and the ID, IT department in the basement versus on the third floor for the extra spaces? It, it, could, it could be either way. We just thought, um, you know, they have a lot of stuff coming in there and they want to be next to that IT room. And so we thought, um, we just thought it might be easier to, to put them down there. So I, I just did some napkin type math. Um, you know, adding that 4,700 square feet based off of the numbers you guys provided is about $1.3 million. I still am not terribly convinced you know, since we operate out of that amount of square foot, you know, since we operate, <clears throat> taking up an extra 4,700 square feet, I'm still not convinced that, that we need that. Um, again, I'm not an architect, so you know, help me understand why um, we would need an extra 4,700 square feet. Um, I just looked through some of the comparisons of what we're at now and where we're at. It seems like, you know, we have external conference rooms, which are great, but then we have extra internal conference rooms, which is, can't use the same conference rooms for both internal and external type meetings um, as we do now. I guess I'm just trying to be a conscious steward of the fact that you know we're not flipping the bill for this. I'm sure you guys hear this a lot when you're in government. Sure. Um, and 1.3 million dollars seems like a really large number to me um, when we're dealing with seven point. And I did that on the lower estimate of 7.2, um, not on the higher estimate of 7.8. So I, I guess help me understand that. Yeah, and I guess it 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 we we didn't we, we sort of did these as separate as separate exercises, and and it came from our our programming exercise where we sat down with the staff and we said what's working, what's not working, how can we improve it, and listed first of all the the the, the numbers of staff you have now, and then those spaces that they felt were necessary to do their jobs, and we came up with that list. Um, I would, and I mentioned that apples to apples uh, uh, comparison before, and maybe we need to go back and do a little bit more um, analysis of that to see to see where that discrepancy is, because I think in terms of, you know, the big drivers are our offices and workspaces, and we've actually um, we we've, we've actually probably have a net less hard offices or enclosed offices and more workstations. So um, from, from that standpoint, we should have less sort of people space. But I think, I think maybe what's, what's driving that are the, are the, like you mentioned, some of the conference spaces, the, the uh, collaborate, collaboration spaces, those kinds of things. Yeah, and so. again, cursory looking through this, and I want to beat this <clears throat> rooms, you know, again, I'm in this building quite a bit, and maybe I'm wrong, um, but, you know, the conference rooms aren't all always full. So I, my concern is, are we building it because we can? Um, and again, everybody would like to have everything on the wish list, I get that, um, but funds aren't unlimited. And so that that's my concern with some of these as I look through it. We don't have them now when we exist, and we conduct business, and life is pretty good. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. 
um, do we really need all that additional stuff? Yes, Jose. Um, I'm going to echo what uh, Alderman Hammond has said. You know, I've been finding my, my way around this building for over 30 years. Um, when I go into a building, if I don't know where I'm going, I look at the directory on the wall. And quite honestly, if somebody comes in the building and they can't read English, I think they should leave and come back when they can read English and find their way to the par right department. Uh, this is going to be put on the back of the taxpayers. Um, we seem to be doing our, the, the, the departments in this building seem to be doing their jobs just fine in the space they have. The police department just left and went to their own new building within the past couple of years. We just voted to close the city assessor's office, which is opening up more space. I really don't understand why we need more space. This, this concept of a welcome center where um, our people leave their offices, which is a time, which is time inefficient, and come down and greet the people. Um, I think it's a, you know, like Alderman Hammond said, it's a wish list thing. You know, I would like to have the sports core in my house and a wine cellar and my own microbrewery while we're at it, but I can't afford those things. And I don't think um, I don't think the taxpayers need to take some new cosmopolitan cosmopolitan approach to finding different departments when, when again, the taxpayers and the residents of this city have been for decades finding their way around the building. I think that there are some, in, in your study, I think there are some assumptions built in that we, that uh, maybe the taxpayers aren't on board, are not going to be on board with the same assumptions that you put into this proposal. I think that I, as technology increases, it's arguable at one point we're not going to have a library as technology increases. And I know that's going to scare librarians greatly, but uh, uh, the point is, as the technology increases, the job can be done with less people and less space. And I don't think we need um, to put the bur extra burden on the taxpayers back of uh, some pie in the sky, nice welcome center approach. I think I think things are functional as they are, and I'm more interested in finding out what it takes to keep the building going as opposed to um, some feel-good uh, renovations. Thank you, Jose. Mike? Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, you propose that there is some extra space on the third floor that could be used for, like, DPW administration and engineering. Uh, if that was utilized for that purpose, uh, that's a plus for this building, but I'm wondering how much would that square footage uh, cost us if we added it to the other scenarios that you gave us for comparison? Do you have any rough idea what that could be around? Well, we did We did look at that, and, and we came up with uh, rough numbers. We were about, I think, uh, six hundred fifty to $750,000, and that was based on the program that we had come up with, which was, uh, and it was the... I think offhand it was about a total of about 4,000 4, square feet, I think, gross. Thank you. Alderman Lassard. Thank you, Chairman. I I'm, I'm just have a question. There has been some chat about combining two of our fire stations into one and building a fire station. What would the possibility of having this beautiful new fire station and having City Hall built above it instead of... And we don't, and we don't have, we don't have employees to be the welcome wagons to City Hall. That would mean we'd have to hire someone, and all that goes with that. We just don't have that. So it seems like all the designs factor in a welcome center, which we don't have to begin with. So is that considered in the dollars when we go to to make an approval? We just don't have the welcome wagons here. But could you take, if we were to build a new fire station, that we're combining two fire stations and putting it into one big fire station, City Hall to be built above that on the second and perhaps third floor, combining some departments. And um, we're, we've been losing employees. We're cutting down aldermen to 10. We're cutting down. We're not getting bigger. Yeah, I guess uh, to answer your question, anything's possible. So yes, we could probably do it. We didn't. We did not um, look at that as part of the study, um, but 
your, your concept would, would certainly be uh, a possibility. I, I can't think of any reason why it, why it wouldn't be. And I, I think in, in, in just a, a comment on the, on the, the welcome wagon thing, I, I think the intention of the design isn't to add staff, it's to use what you, the existing staff. It's just a different way that they're positioned and, uh, and work in the building. So that right now you, you in effect have that welcoming person. If someone comes into the building, um, they usually go to the city clerk and the city clerk is the person that directs them. So. Thank you. Alderman Donahue. Um, thank you. Um, I had a couple, one question, one observation. Um, given the total redo of, of City Hall, um, we would still be left with a structure though that is about 100 years old. Mm -hmm. What would be the, um, the natural expectancy of the, of the building itself? Or would the renovations somehow give it new life? Like yeah, well, the, the renovations would definitely give it new life. Okay. I mean, this building has lasted 100 years. And it has, frankly, it hasn't been really well taken care of. I think if you renovated this with, with what is, is in the cost and, and kept it maintained, it would last another 100 years. Now, with the caveat that mechanical systems aren't going to last 100 years, electrical systems aren't going to last 100 years, but the, the bricks and mortar, the structure, there's no reason why that couldn't last another 100 years if it's properly maintained. So, Always a challenge in <laughs> city government. Yep. The second thing I'm just going to throw out just for people to think about is that this grand, glorious hall here, and I'm sure it's, it's like the courthouse, you know, which was so horribly divided up and built over. I'm sure it is absolutely gorgeous up there. Um, but this is a room that is used twice a month. Or when I was in practice, we used to, the state would, would rent it for uh, unemployment compensation hearings and, and things like that. Um, and I think as we're, as we're looking forward to it, um, we, we should be, try to be thinking about multi-purpose rooms, you know, where 10 alder chairs can be brought in. Um, there definitely needs to be enough room for the, for the public. Um, it, but, and I see Mr. Erickson sitting in the back and he'll probably just kill me, but the Roca room is a very nice room and um, it can be set up technology wise. We could actually sit so we could see each other and have good conversations. We could do that. Yes, we could, Don. <laughs> I said we couldn't, I said I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> a long timer talking. Um, but, I mean, these are just some things as, as uh, government becomes less important. The majesty of government becomes a little less important as time goes on. And um, I think we can be plenty majestic in the, in the Roca room. Uh, you know, I, I think we could probably arrange to use it twice a month. Um, so I think, though, that, you know, there are some other things just in terms of space needs. I really do think what these folks are thinking about is not a welcome area where people in our community come in to do fairly limited business, but nonetheless, there are people who come in. It's just a service center, so that it just is a much more efficient way to do business. And of course, in this community, we welcome and have been enriched by people who speak all kinds of different languages, including German. Um, my dad was a pharmacist, and he learned how to speak pidgin German because you know, the ladies in the 50s and 60s still couldn't speak English. But I think that, you know, that concept, I think, really works for us and, um, and that we should, that that needs to be a key part of whatever it is that we do do. Um, but this is, this is pretty big, unless, you know, we can not build out and just, you know, chop, you know, put the glass up. In other words, not expand the building not build it out, even though it looks like a small build out, but not do that. I mean, that might be a way of dealing with the excess space. We still have a huge cost, but nonetheless, those are just some random thoughts. Thank you, Alderman, uh, Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, originally, originally, the uh, charge of this uh, committee was not only to look at City Hall, but also look at a fire department and you know, the, 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 location, uh, the location that would be best for the City Hall and building a fire station would be over on 10th and Wisconsin. 
And I think if you, uh, uh, I appreciate your suggestion, Alderman Lassard, but I think the problem with that building that on the first floor is that you would be increasing the, the, the cost of the fire station dramatically over what it could be. For example, for example, excuse me, your napkin math, Alderman Hammond, the $1.3 million with that additional 4,000 square feet probably would pay for a fire station uh, close to it. And I envision, I envision a new fire station to look similar to our transit building, which is basically a metal building, and then they have offices. Well, in the case of the fire station, that, would, that part that was not the metal building would become the living quarters. And I forwarded some information. I don't want to get off track on this, but I, I forwarded some information to the fire chief, Mr. Amodio, and I think Don and the mayor. American Steel has built fire stations all over the country, and the cost per square foot would be considerably less than a brick-and-mortar building. And I think with putting that on the first floor and a city hall up above would be drastically more expensive than doing a stand standalone fire station. Thank Thanks. you. Alderman Hammond. Um, just, just want to make a clarification, and I appreciate your comments, Jim, but the charge of this committee was really to look at alternatives for City Hall. The fire department kind of got thrown in at the last minute as we found out what was going on with the New York Street Station and the Mead Street Station. So um, it wasn't the charge of, of John's committee to look at what to do with the fire department. Um, I just kind of said to him, hey, by the way, could you take a peek at this because it came up in conversations that we had um, you know ideally if we're going to build um, we'd want to do as much get as much co economies of scale as humanly possible um, relative to building both if we can share common areas bathrooms conference rooms all that kind of stuff I'm sure you guys would agree it would work out much smoother so as part of that we certainly want to look um, but you know th the original charge of this committee was to take a look at what to do with this building or alternative sites. Thanks. Thank you. Alderman Bell Bellinger. Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, thanks, Don, for your clarification for that. Uh, again, we weren't charged with looking at anything related to the fire department. And um, so, in fact, we, we didn't do that. We concentrated our efforts on, on looking how we were going to solve the problems uh, that were present with this building. And this building, um, if you gentlemen um, saw the ZS report and you concur with you know the findings in that in the, in the dollars that were um, related to that um, it's it's there's some significant challenges and and this building has been neglected and if we were to leave this building and and build new um, we would either have to tear it down or we would have to, and there would be some cost with that obviously and lead and asbestos abatement um, related to that and or there would be a significant developers incentive that would have to be put in place to cover the roof the mechanical the windows the the north wall the parapets that are, are pulling apart the you know all the other problems that are associated with this building so um, you know so those are some of the things to, to keep in mind so when, when we look at the 10.6 to 11.1 million dollar figure yeah, it's, it's a big number. It's a really big number. Um, you know, but if we were to leave this building and build new for the, the seven, roughly $7 million, $7.6 million figure, there would be another 3 or $4 million cost of leaving this building or if we were to have a developer develop it and keep it, or there would be a, a cost to demolish it too. Um, so, there, so there's added cost to that. So it, it becomes more in line um, to, to stay here, and and um, Alderman Hammond's um, concerns of of space needs um, have merit. Uh, do we need everything that that is proposed here? You know, probably not. But when we get into the initial stages of these things, you know, that's when we decide. You know, what do we need? What do we? What can we get away with? And and what don't we need? And, and how to build out. Um, to, to Alderman Donahue's point, can we not do the expansion on the front? I don't think, and in, in the architects can correct me if I, if I misstate anything, but the purpose for that expansion is to get rid of the fire escapes and to put in the stairwells, to run mechanical chases, and to um, 
become ADA compliant. And if you don't do that, there's, you have all those challenges again that, you know, that we're going to have. So, um, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of where we're at. So we, we've got issues with this building. We need to figure out, are we staying? Are we going? And, you know, how are we going to address these things? And, and the feedback I'm getting from residents of the city is there is a, an emotional attachment to this building, and they would prefer, the people that have reached out to me, would prefer to do what we can to bring this building back to the, the shape that it should have been and, and take care of it the way we should have been in the past. So, Thank you, Alderman. Uh, Alderman Trester? Since I'm kind of new on the council and was not privy to the, the study before this, I look at this building and I say part of the charm in this building is some of the stuff that is here now. Not only the outside of the building, but looking at chambers and, and, and the woodwork in this building. And I'm wondering, does it all have to be gutted to the outside walls and to the floor and start over? Can't we use some of what we have? Thank you. Alderman Heineman. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, not to get away from the, the existing city hall, but the square footage on these other proposals is all the exact same thing. Now, am I to be led to believe these that 25,000 square feet, that meets our needs for in 2016 and beyond, right? Are we just, are we just you're giving us a proposal that you're gonna, we're going to come back and say, oh, yeah, we should have put another... Uh, uh, 10,000 square feet on that building. I want to know when these proposals is this are these are meeting our futuristic needs As far as we understand yes that that and I think it was pointed out that you're not really growing And so there's not a whole lot of growth in that in those numbers now uh, Obviously things can change from year to year, but for from what we know today That should meet your needs in the foreseeable future Okay, thank you Alderman Thiel. Yes, thank you um I guess what I would like to have seen is, I know your recommendation was for City Hall and what that was going to look like. I would have liked to have seen what one of these buildings was going to look like, how you would have laid it out, how much extra stuff was going to be in there. I think that comes to Don's thing that maybe there's too much put into these buildings even that we need. Um, I think maybe even seven million is a lot for one of these buildings. I think we could have probably done this and maybe a firehouse together because sure. we have both needs in the city. Um, if we didn't need all this, maybe we don't need all this. Um, I would like to see that layout. Maybe it was there and I missed it somewhere. They, they have shown what they've done in other communities and some of those new buildings, and I just asked if they had some of those exhibits tonight that they could show us what they've done in St. Francis, what they've done in Oak Creek. So you get a visualization. And again, you look at you look at spaces, and if you look at the offices, they're pretty much a match, other than planning and development is probably getting the biggest impact. Everything else is in common and in shared. New bathrooms, handicapped accessible bathrooms are much larger than the bathrooms that we have today. Hallways, a little bit larger. So a lot of it is in circulation when you look at that extra 4,000 square feet. It's not all everyone's getting a bigger office. So we, we really did look at today's space. How would we be in a new building? How could it best be served the public and what we do as government? And if we're going to invest... You know, four million just in renovating this building in terms of tuck pointing windows, central layer. I think it, you know, is is prudent of us. Then, how is it best to serve the public as well as in this space, not just renovate it and say, okay, the building's good, but yet we still are poor at circulating business as we do today. Well, that was part of the charge here, and, and what we did is we sat back and looked at what the architect said and what they have done in other communities that have gone through the same process. How do we want to conduct business in the future and how we want to serve? We always talk about being more open. Well, how many times have we come to this council and there's been a lot of citizens that have come and we had to have them out in the hallway, haven't had a part of the participation. We have an opportunity to open this chambers up and make this room multi-purpose, not just used two times a month, but used for other gatherings, other public meetings. We have plenty of meetings where we're scattered throughout the community and trying to serve our public. And this is an opportunity again. So that's what we're presenting. It's not saying that this is the final plan, this is what we're doing. 
We just want to present this in terms of what's available. And I think it would be good if you can see some of what they've done in the modern. And that's what I was going with. I, I think it would have been neat. I did look at pictures online as they were talking at St. Francis and Oak Creek. But I mean, both of those buildings are completely different. I mean, it would just been nice to see what you were thinking of as a rendering for one of these and how it'd be laid out. And to yeah. see where that seven million is going compared to just looking at square footage and all right, this is what it's going to be. You know what I mean? I just think it would give us a better idea of what's going on. And we, we do have some examples of those buildings that we used as cost models. Um, but we, it, frankly, our, our, um, the, the charge of what we were to do did not include those services. To design a, a seven different buildings on seven different sites, is a, is, we'd love to do it, but I don't think you'd want to pay us for it. <laughs> so, but, um, so, so, and, and it's not uncommon at all for us to, to use a program because that defines what you need. That def defines the needs, and we have great historical data that we that those programs turn into. So we say 25,000 square feet. It might be in the end 22. It might be 27. It's going to be somewhere within that, and we we feel that you know that should at least give you enough information to make a, 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 a educated decision. So, but if you'd like to see some of those other samples, we have those. They don't really apply necessarily, other than it'll give you an idea of the. Uh, the, 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 some of the finishes, the materials, and kind of the, the uh, space planning that's involved in those that we would envision here. That, that. Okay, thank you. Alderman Hyman. Uh, thank you. Um, just to kind of echo Mr. Beeble's comments, um, you know, I, I didn't want to leave the illusion that, you know, the department heads, uh, except for Dave Beeble, were looking for, you know, expanded <laughs> offices. You know, uh, additional 14 or excuse me additional 2,000 square feet were common areas new conference rooms bathrooms public and staff um, break room that type of thing um, council chambers was an additional 1,400 square feet so between those two that's 3,400 of the 4,700 square feet that were additional and then city planning we had an additional 900 so you know those three areas were um, made up the majority of that 4,700 square feet so again you know no shrine to Dave Beeble over there, um, but I wanted to give you an idea of where um, that additional space, you know, would be needed. And to Mary Lynn's comments, you know, maybe we need to look at, you know, where council meets. You know, that that was, you know, 2,000 of that 4,700 square feet <coughs> tied up in there, and it, again, 300, roughly 300 bucks a square. Again, talking real money. Thank you, Alderman Boren. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to follow up on what Alderman Trester had to say. Uh, I remember back when the police department moved out of City Hall, we spent approximately $500,000, and part of that was the entrances that we now have in the east and west that are close to the public, uh, supposedly because we're not ADA compliant with that many entrances to City Hall. Uh, uh, I, I think, uh, and also what Alderman Bellinger was saying about the walkaway costs if we decided to leave this building, that all depends on the kind of a deal you work out with a, with a developer. Uh, they, they, you know, they would buy it at a reasonable price. They would probably assume a lot of those costs. I don't think that we have to spend three or four million dollars to bring this building up to date. And then some of the improvements that we make are probably not going to be compatible with what they want to design here for apartments or condos. So I think our, our I think your your walkaway costs are tremendously. Uh, tremendously on the high side if we have to do any at all. And also, uh, I don't know, you know who some of the aldermen have been talking to. I, I certainly appreciate, and I go along with Alderman Trester, a lot of the stuff in this building is not going to be reproduced. Uh, and I, you know, I would much rather, in a way, look at using the existing city hall. We've got, the, we've got a very handy clerk's office down on the first floor. It would be more handy if the if the east door was open, and the same with the building inspection department. We're saving forty thousand dollars a year by not having to rent the office space on the corner for the city attorney's office. Uh, I think we have to also take a look, and maybe we can discuss after these gentlemen are gone. But I think we have to take a look, and I asked Mr. Beeble for this, and I appreciate he probably didn't have enough time to get this together. But the five or six things that are deemed necessary to make this building as is more uh, <coughs> compatible for the future, like the heating and air conditioning, the roof, how much, the first thing that has to be done, for example, the roof, how much is that going to cost? We do that next year. 
The next year we do heating and air conditioning. How much is that going to cost? So I really don't see a lot of problems with this building the way it is, except bringing it up to date to a certain extent, making, making it more ADA compliant. I agree for people with physical challenges the way it is right now. It's, a, it's very, uh, very not, it's not easy at all for people to get in here. And by putting in a new lift, if we decide to stay here, opening up those east and west em entrances and doing the repair and spread those over a four or five year period, doing the most critical ones first. And I think we could do that for four or five million dollars. Thank you. Thank you. Don? Um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to touch on this whole carrying co or uh, transition cost, and I'm certainly not uh, an architect. Um, I do have just one question for you guys to follow up on uh, Rosemary's and Alderman Bourne's. Uh, when you guys were looking at the renovations of this building, how much of the existing stuff, you know, woodworking and things, would you guys try to reclaim um, as part of that to keep that, that history? It, it, was that part of anything you guys had considered as in the scope? Well, we didn't look at it in detail, but we assumed we'd be using as, as much as is practical. Um, the first thing would be probably the, the interior framing and the windows. That's pretty, pretty easy. I, I mentioned the stairway. We'd keep that. Um, we, would, we would try to reuse as many of the marble panels in the bathrooms as we could. Um, and so, you know, in, in, until we get into the really the nitty gritty of the design, it's, it's a little hard to, uh, to specify you know what we would do but we I mean we would try to use as much of it as possible I think the, the majority of what you're talking about is uh, woodwork mm -hmm. so and then just to touch a little bit on you know the walk away cost of the building um, you know as Jim and I have been involved in a lot of these um, deals where we've provided incentives to developers to 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 mm -hmm. put things together um, and typically we've stayed around that 15 to 16 percent of project cost um, if it's inside a TIF. So if we're looking at a, for example, a $10 million project, um, you might be looking at a million and a half-ish um, in TIF incentive or whatever incentive is, is provided. So when you're talking about walk-away costs, if we're looking at a you know, $7.5 million project, add another you know, million and a half to two, depending, again, on the size and scope of, of the project that we you know, in, entail. Um, we've had some conversations, nothing formal with that with people but I think uh, Chad or Jim one you two it's what 10 or 12 10 12 million where they were for if to put the apartments in here did they yeah so it's about 12 million so you're looking at probably million seven ish of of if we stuck with our kind of 15 percent um, you know rule of thumb that we've stuck to kind of over the last you know several years as part of those negotiations so hopefully that puts a little color on the conversation about the walk away costs um you know going forward and again if somebody was going to take over the building we're not going to put a ton of money into it obviously because to jim's point they're going to put their own stamp on it but that just gives you a little color around that conversation thanks Pat. thank you alderman drawn thank you Chairman Wolf, just real quickly, I'm looking at everything and I'm thinking about this. One thing I'd like to, to consider is doing maybe a two-phase project plan where we're not doing this all at one. Maybe we, we cut this in half and we look at the, the necessities of doing the structural repair as, as needed on, in particular on that side. But repurposing what we already have, enhancing it to, to a certain point, maybe addressing some of the welcome, if you will, the, the flow and the coming in here. Uh, for people, the, the one thing I would like to say is if we have extra room and extra spaces, perhaps those do not get developed right away. Perhaps that stays in the basement as is and even part of some of the structure that's happening. And just start with something that would help us get to where we need to be to get upgraded and then look at down the line here, maybe a five or ten year project scope, what we would do for the next phase. Uh, right now we have a lot of road repair that still needs to be addressed, and I think, you know, I, I'm hearing from taxpayers, we have to really be careful about how we spend our money, but do, do it smartly. And I think the infrastructure of, of starting with what we need to do here can be built upon and not thrown away, so it might be a smart way to look at it. Thank you. Alderman Lassard. Thank you. I'm just wondering what are the costs to fix what's broke right now and not change any of the rooms and not change any of the bathrooms? How much is it going to cost just to fix what's broke? Oh. And I thought you had said four million. Yeah, according to the ZS study, it's three point nine, and that's about a year old now. So, factor inflation to it. So four million just to fix what's broke. 
Obviously, that doesn't have to occur all at the same time, but it would be staged out. Could it could not? be the next three, five years you're going to be approaching that figure. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Alderman Donahue. Um, I'm thinking. I'm just. I'm wondering if we are at the point where we need to be thinking about what our next steps are going to be. Um, the the design that you folks drew is really lovely. Um, I am concerned about it being somewhat overbuilt, uh, and I think all of us are, are concerned about the cost. I haven't heard from a lot of people, but the people I have heard from are not happy about $11 million for a 100-year-old building. They're just not. But I haven't heard from that many people, so that's hardly a bellwether. Um, so I think Alderman Thiel brought up a good point. Um, the focus has been on renovating City Hall. I think at least two of the additional sites are worth looking at in more detail. Um, and I think if we had a basic visual of what that might look like, you know, beyond just the square and the rectangle, that might be helpful. Um, I'm, I'm a little disappointed that the Building Use Committee did not consider hiring a real estate agent to go out and see what is out there in terms of existing buildings that would not cost that much to remodel. I do appreciate, you know, you folks looked at the press and, and Nemshoff. Um, I think the Nemshoff building, um, we're kind of at the point where a city hall doesn't have to be grand. And it, I mean, we aren't quite as romantic about municipal government, if we ever were, I, you know, I, we aren't so much anymore. But I really think, so I, I'm asking for all of us kind of what our next steps are. This is a classic case. I mean, this has been an, an extremely good discussion. But moving forward, it's really hard with, you know, 15 of us um, to figure out, you know, what the next steps are. And maybe, uh, you know, to ask building use to, um, uh, uh, to consider some existing buildings um, and depending on the cost, of course, and being very sensitive to your time and, and efforts. Looking at, you know, at least two of those sites, I think, are, are decent sites. And you just happened to put the fire station there. And it was not the charge of the Building Use Committee to look at the fire station. But, you know, that might be something that we want to look at. And so I'm, I'm just thinking Building Use should meet again. I think there's only one alder, which is, is, is Alderman Bellinger. And I think I, I attended two of the three meetings. And um, I think if more of us just attended, so you know, we could get a little bit more input and then maybe come back and have this discussion again in a, in a more focused way. And not to say that this, uh, with a decision this big, you have to start somewhere. And I think we have done that tonight. But I think we need to move forward um, in a not organized fashion, but more focused fashion at this at this at this time. Okay, thank you, Chad. Just as a follow up to Mary Lynn's comments, we did a thorough search of every building. Uh, we didn't necessarily work with a realtor, but we worked with our building inspection department. We worked with SCEDC and ourselves and looked at every building in the immediate downtown that could potentially work for a city hall. The challenge is, is we don't have a lot of space that's over 10,000 square feet. That's, you know, the issue. So if we're looking at a building of 15,000 to 25,000 square feet that's going to be conducive and, and work well and it doesn't have to be a grand building, there's nothing that big in the downtown. That was the, that's the challenge, and that what came out of it was the Sheboygan Press building and the Nemshoff building. The Nemshoff building, I think, is 12,000? 20,000 20, 20, square feet total. I spoke with the owner of that building because I heard rumors on the street that Nemshoff was leaving, and he said to his knowledge, there's nothing, they're not leaving, and they just extended their lease. So there's, you know, that was the only opportunity of a building that seemed to work in that realm, and we talked about in detail. Um, separate from the building use committee, but at staff level, over opportunities for other buildings in the in the area, and there really is nothing. And you made the key assumption that City Hall does need to be downtown. I think that's a good assumption, but it's one that we haven't talked about. 
and and that the that could be the station is no longer downtown and i'm not saying that it shouldn't be downtown uh, but that is an assumption that was made yeah and and i guess if that's the direction of the council to look at areas outside of the downtown for a city hall then that's what you can go back and look at those buildings but we looked at the buildings in in and around the immediate downtown okay thank you just a real quick question for uh, the group what would you say or suggest to the to the council would be the next step moving forward and then i'll have a few more older persons that ask some questions oh, yes. yes what would our next step be what would you recommend to the council well <clears throat> boy it sounds like it's coming down to dollars and cents always. primarily and I, I understand it always does so i think maybe we do look at um you know if you could give us more direction on um, we talked about expanding the the scope of the of the area that we're looking at. I mean, I guess that would be the first thing that we would want to start on. Um, maybe we need to sit down again and and with staff and with the committee and look at at the needs, the perceived needs um, that program piece. If we need to get it less than twenty five thousand, how do we do that? We need some direction on that. Um, uh, so I think we sort of need to pull back a little bit and, and sort of revisit some of the things we visited and then expand however you deem appropriate. Okay, thank you. Alderman Thiel. Um, yes, one thing I know that came up um, is if we did do City Hall, we have to, we, I mean, we're going to take everything out. Where are we going to put everybody? And roughly, did we, does anybody have a cost for that? Because uh, that's a lot of people we got to put somewhere. And if we need a building that's going to house how many square feet, where are we going to put all these people? And where are you going to put all the files? Where are we going to put everything? Um, and I just want to bring up, because uh, Mr. Peters is here, and he commented before, did we ever look at uh, maybe building onto the Army, doing the Army and a City Hall next to it? That was one of his concerns, and I think we should at least ask that. Okay, thank you. Um, Alder Alderman Bellinger. Thank you, Chairman. Um, when, when this group got together, uh, one of the... Uh, things that we were charged with doing was to figure out can this current city hall be reconfigured in such a way that we could conduct business in a more efficient manner moving forward because um, everybody um, can concur that the current way that we're doing business isn't the most efficient way uh, based on the uh, limitations within the current um, layout of the building. So. Um, quite frankly, the people on the committee were very skeptical that that could be achieved. And uh, it, it kind of looked at one point in time, we were looking at, 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 you know, the only option would be to build new and, and leave this building. And um, the architects came back with this and said, no, we, we've got, got an idea. We can make this work. And um, there was some added cost to it. Um, but, you know, that, that's... That, that's what we looked at. And to Alderman Thiel's point of the relocation, um, that's been discussed. There hasn't been any numbers put forth, but um, David Beeble has been uh, working on that. And it, it wouldn't be you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars is what I've been told. It, it wouldn't be anything like that. It would be um, something, you know, something less than that. And um, you know, so you know, that's, that, that's kind of where we're at. And, and I would challenge Alderman Hammond to, um, you know, his, his 12 to 15 percent, you know, figure for, re, you know, for development, you know, incentives is, you know, I believe it's all been new construction. It hasn't been leaving an existing building like this that needs a new roof, needs new HVAC, needs new windows. The parapets are coming apart. The north wall is going to, you know, is pulling apart. The floor. I mean, if you look at the ZS report, I mean, it's significant, the amount of work that needs to be done. And the dollars are significant, too. So, um, you know, I, I, I would think that for somebody that was going to take over a building in that kind of condition would want to have, you know, that cost covered. Thank you. Alderman Hammond. Um, thanks. Um, first, that was just what we've done historically um, with development. Um, the council obviously has the parameters to do whatever they want. Um, you know, I don't know that it makes sense for us to go much higher than that 15 to 
18% because oftentimes the math doesn't work out when we're dealing with TIFs and TIDs and those types of things. It's just what we've done as a rule of thumb. Um, I agree. Secondly, um, I think to Alderperson Donahue's comment, um, and you know, thank you guys. It sounds like, it, I don't want you to feel like you're getting peppered up here, but obviously this is uh, something that's been kicked down the road and when we had decided to take a look at it again, um, there's a lot of opinions. I think to be fair to the Building Use Committee and to our um, consultants, we need as a body to determine what a budget is gonna be for this. That, that I think is the next step. We have to determine what we're willing to spend. We know now what the ranges are roughly if we wanna keep operating out of here versus building new and we can tweak around the edges, you know, maybe get that cost down. But we have to determine as a body um, what cost or what amount of money we're willing to spend um, to accomplish this and then what that needs to look like. Um, to ask these guys to go back and even the building use, and by the way, as a side note, for those that are here from the building use, um, that was pretty much all citizen members, so I appreciate your time and energy and efforts in what you did um, throughout those meetings. Um, I know it's not easy dealing with government. Um, obviously, we have a lot of opinions. So we need to give them a budget that they can work within to develop what we want um, or what we believe is the best option for the city. And I believe that that's where we need to start um, is what amount of money are we willing to spend. Um, I don't know if we're gonna be able to hash that out tonight. In fact, I'm certain we're not gonna be able to. I think that's a conversation for uh, another meeting. Um, there's a few other things that go into that, like bonding. Um, you know, more than likely if we spend $11 million, we don't have that sitting in savings. Um, so there's gonna be some you know, debt that needs to be taken out to deal with that. So I, I think, again, I don't mean to beat this dead horse, but the next step I really believe is figuring out how much do we wanna spend. If the answer is we're not willing to spend $11 million, then renovating City Hall is probably off the table. If the answer is we're only willing to spend $5 million, then the question is do we bring City Hall up to code or whatever uh, John and Dave were talking about, or do we build a scaled down version of what our friends at Bray presented? Um, those are the decisions we have to make going forward because to have them guys drop a much more pretty pictures um, for buildings that we're not willing to spend the money on is kind of a waste of time in my opinion. So again, I, I think our next step as this body is to provide a budget and uh, maybe hone in a little bit more on what we want to see um, and then go back to them so they're not wasting their time and the committee's not wasting their time. Thanks, Todd. Thank you. Any more questions? Comments? Oh, yes, Mr. Bellinger. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Alderman Hammond, I agree with you. I think that's a, a good next step. Um, I would make a motion to refer this the budget, you know, a budgetary number in a decision to come up with a funding source and what that dollar is going to be to strategic fiscal planning. Okay. Mr. Heidemann. Uh, I'm sorry, we have a motion on the floor. Second. We have a second, a motion and a second. Questions? Okay. Well, uh, what I was going to do is um, uh, I took an informal survey of people uh, that I knew that are all taxpayers, and they said rather than spend $11 million, Build new, and and that was overwhelmingly anybody anybody that I talked to said rather than invest that type of money, as because we have roads to fix, we have other uh, other obligations to our citizens other than building a uh, you know a, a Taj Mahal out of an older building. But I'm uh, willing to send this back to committee too. All right, thank you, Alderman Thiel. Uh, thank you. I think when it comes to a dollar amount, I think. In my eyes, it looks different if we just do City Hall or if we do have the other need of, of a fire department. I would like to see us combine both because we got two needs that we have. And I would, if it goes back to that committee to coming out with a dollar amount, I'd like to see a dollar amount getting both things done so we can get them both done um, at the same time at a reasonable cost because I think that will reflect the dollar amount better. Mr. Hammond. I think as part of this, we have to look at both. So I think we need to set a budget um, because we don't, have our, our arms around yet what the fire department's needs are. We've been working on it, but we don't have our arms around that. Um, so I think we need to look at both, and if we can create some economies of scale between the two, obviously that's only gonna save us 
you know, more money. Um, so I think the strategic fiscal, as they look at these dollar amounts, should look at if we did a standalone city hall and then if we combine the two and what the budgets would be. So. Okay. Any, any further questions? Oh, Alderman Bourne. Uh, getting back to what Alderman Lassard uh, asked about uh, what is it going to cost just to bring this thing up to code, uh, I'd really like some uh, firm numbers on what it's going to cost to bring this up to code ADA and the other things, the he heating and air conditioning, the roof, and then also laid out what's the most important, probably the roof, do we do that next year, what do we do the next year, and over a five-year period what that's going to cost us just to bring this, this place up to code without doing a, you know, a total regut as one of the options. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Dave, is that something you can put together in a relatively? We, we have some of that in the CS report. Right. Mm -hmm. But the priority of what needs to happen for a second, third. Thank you. Okay. So we have a first and a second. Any further questions? Okay. Um, all in favor? Or, I'm sorry? Clarify the motion on what kind of number? Is it the numbers you said, Don? That no, there's no, there's no numbers. It was a motion to refer. Oh, just a motion to refer. Oh, to strategic fiscal planning to come up with a budget. Okay, I got you. I'm good with that. Perfect. Okay. Okay. All, uh, we have, how do we take a vote? Just do you want to do a roll call? Yeah, let's do a roll call. Okay. Bellinger? Aye. Bitter? Aye. Bourne? Aye. Damro? Aye. Donahue? Aye. Braun? Aye. Hammond? Aye. Heidemann? Aye. Herman? Aye. Herman? Jose? Aye. Pass? Aye. Lassard? Aye. Field? Aye. Chester? Aye. Ward? Aye. 15 ayes. Ayes have it. All right. All right. So our next meeting date, which we, yeah, we don't, will be uh, to be determined. And uh, motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. We're, we're adjourned. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you.